microphone doesn't work, just let me know. Thanks. This morning we're going to treat an interesting question, and that is, why do we call God Father? Can we call God Mother? In the second reading, we see an example of the unanimous Christian tradition of calling God Father. St. Paul writes, All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So we're going to go through four considerations to help us understand this theology of God as Father. So the first consideration, we have to remember that God doesn't have a body. He is a pure spirit. He exists outside of the universe. So if he has no body, he is therefore uh, neither male nor female. He has no sex. Okay, but if God is neither male nor female... How do we relate to him as a person? We're persons. God is not an impersonal force. God is a person. So we're, in our own experience, human experience, we only relate to people as male and female. So how do we relate to him as a person? And that leads us to our second point. The Old Testament does use the language of motherhood to to describe God. Two examples. As one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you. And right there we have God actually comparing his love to a mother's love. He does that on purpose. Second, can a woman forget her suckling child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. In the Old Testament, in Hebrew, uh, the word for mercy comes etymologically from the word for womb. So there's a connection between God's mercy and the maternal womb. Why is that? Because the womb is the most intimate connection between two persons, mother and child. And you see the loving concern of the mother for this dependent child. So if you want to understand God's mercy, you have to understand motherhood. You have to understand maternity. Third consideration. So... The Bible does use maternal language to describe God, but it only ever calls God Father. Not once does, does it ever call him Mother. And Jesus' own example, Jesus always called God Father. For Christians, for those of us who believe that Jesus is God, we see his example as purposeful. That's not an accident. Now, obviously, if you don't believe Jesus is God, you you won't follow his example as normative. But for us, this is the main reason why Christians will always call God Father, just because we want to follow Jesus' example. Now, it raises a really um, good question that maybe a lot of us ask. Was Jesus just following the cultural customs of his time? Because in many things, Jesus followed the cultural customs. But what we actually see when we look at Jesus' actions and analyze them very carefully, he broke the customs he wanted to, especially the cultural customs that were unjust. So in Jesus' time, first century Judaism, a man could divorce his wife, but a woman couldn't divorce her husband. So an imbalance. Jesus eliminates that imbalance. He says neither party can divorce. That's not part of God's original plan. Also, in that time, Women's testimony was not accepted under, in Jewish law. Now, if women's testimony is not accepted, you can't call them forth as a witness. Jesus doesn't accept that. He chooses his first witnesses to be women, the first witnesses of his resurrection. So he breaks that uh, cultural, unfair, unjust custom. We also see that Jesus chose women as his disciples. He let the sinful woman touch him. He talked to them in public. Again, something that wasn't done back then. The point is, when we look over Jesus' actions, we see he's breaking cultural customs all the time. He was actually getting himself into trouble. So you might remember one incident where Jesus says that the Father and he are one. And so the Jewish people, some, 
pick up stones to stone him because they say, you, a man, are making yourself God. So he's, he's quite free to anger people and do whatever he wanted. He even said he had the power to forgive sin. So all these examples. So what we're trying to see here is that Jesus had the freedom to do whatever he wanted. So if he wanted to call God mother, he could have, but he still didn't. And that's going to lead to a, a deeper reason. And this is the fourth final reason. This is the main reason given by Pope Benedict uh, the Sixteenth. When I read this one, this is what made the most sense to me. And it's this. Historically, the Jewish people and the early Christians were surrounded by other cultures and other groups of people that worship false gods as mother. Like we might say Mother Earth. And so when they're worshiping these false gods in a maternal way, it was a kind of pantheism. So pantheism means that God is everywhere. So trees are God, the sky is God, animals are God. But what God, the real God, revealed to the Jewish people is that he's not everywhere. He's outside the universe primarily. He created the universe outside of himself. And so the Jewish people always had to remember this. God is not pantheistic. He's transcendent. He's beyond our universe. This reflects our human experience of, of birth. So when a child is born, the mother is usually close by, right? She's what we call imminent. But the father is outside that process of birth. And so the mother, in a certain sense, has to introduce the father to the child. The father, in a certain sense, is transcendent to the child. So God is called father primarily because he's transcendent. And we say that the Catholic Church is mother because the Catholic Church introduces us to him. Also, notice how women bear life within them. But life for men, we give life outside of ourselves. And in the same way, spiritual life, God gives life outside of himself and it uh, gives birth within the church. Again, that feminine. So we have to ask ourselves and reflect, is God's transcendence that important that we actually have to always call God Father, that we have to protect this idea that God is transcendent? transcendent? And, the, and the answer is yes. Now, if you look at the Old Testament, there's so many stories of the Jewish, the Hebrew people always being tempted to worship false gods. And the false gods that they would worship, or you remember the, the story of the golden calf, they make a... Uh, a calf out of metal. What was the point of that? They're trying to make God in a way they could control him, touch him, and manipulate him. And so what God's always reminding them is that he's outside the universe, he's transcendent, you can't manipulate me, you cannot control me. Women are always closer to us than fathers. Again, that, that connection with birth. And so by always calling God Father, we're always remem remembering he's actually further away from us then he is near. Of course, he always loves us, but he is beyond us. There are two other ideas we want to consider, reflect on, given this reality that God is our Father. And the first uh, consideration, the first idea is that it protects the distinction between the sexes. We already said God has no sex, but he did create humanity male and female. It says in the opening lines of Genesis, God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. It's actually in our complementarity, our masculinity, femininity. That's one of the ways we image God. So our culture is right on the mark when it sees men and women as equal in dignity. That's right, and we always want to fight against sexism. So, for example, spousal abuse, we always want to fight against that. And typically, it's much more common to see the husband abuse uh, the wife. However, the pendulum has now swung so far the other way that we're eliminating the distinction between the sexes. Gay adoption has uh, weakened the right of a child to have a mother and a father. And the principle is very simple, because... Children naturally come from a man and a woman, and because men and women are different, a child has a right to have a mom and a dad. In 2012, Dr. Mark Regneris, he published a study, it's called New 
Family Structure Study. It was published in the journal Social Science Research. And I'll read you um, a quote. It's a summary from Focus on the Family about, from his results. It said, Compared with offspring from married, intact mother-father homes, children raised in same-sex homes are markedly more likely to report overall lower levels of happiness, mental and physical health, be in counseling or mental health therapy twice as much, suffer from depression by large margins, as adults more likely to be unfaithful in married or cohabiting relationships. The study had the largest sample size of any study on the subject up to that date, 15,000 Americans ages 18 to 39. And despite the intense attacks that Regnerus uh, received, he wrote in his response, the probability-based evidence that exists suggests that the biologically intact two-parent household remains an optimal setting for the long-term flourishing of children. The transgender movement will also try to eliminate this distinction between the sexes. So for Christians, if we're always remembering God as Father, that's always going to uh, push against this denial of reality. No, it's true. Men and women are different. Uh, only women can give uh, birth, and men cannot chest feed. Sorry, gentlemen. The doctor, uh, Dr. Richard Fitzgibbons has this long quote about the gifts of mothers and fathers, their distinct gifts, and I'll read it in full. Among the many distinctive talents that mothers bring, three stand out. Their capacity to breastfeed, their ability to understand infants and children, and their ability to offer nurture and comfort. Numerous reports indicate that infants and toddlers prefer mothers to fathers when they are hungry, afraid, or sick. Mothers tend to be more soothing. They are better able than fathers to distinguish between a cry of hunger and a cry of pain. They are also better than fathers at detecting the emotions of their children by looking at their faces, postures, and gestures. Clinical experience suggests that deliberately depriving a child of its mother, motherlessness, causes severe damage because mothers are crucial in establishing a child's ability to trust and to feel safe in relationships. Fathers excel when it comes to providing discipline, play, and challenging children to embrace life's challenges. They also provide essential role models for boys. Their presence in the home protects a child from fear and strengthens a child's ability to feel safe. The extensive research on the serious psychological, academic, and social problems among youth raised in fatherless families demonstrates the importance of the presence of the father in the home for healthy child development. Okay, the second idea, we now realize, okay, God is our father. And it makes us realize, as Dr. Botaro in our consecration book, the one that we're using through St. Joseph, about St. Joseph, Dr. Botaro says that the father's gaze on his children is different than a mother's gaze. He says this, Every single one of us longs for the Father's gaze. We want to be seen and chosen by our dads. It is biological, psychological, and spiritual. We are predisposed for this longing from the moment of our conception. Mom's gaze comes easier. We expect it. And it is the primary necessity to remain secure in our being as we are. It is the gaze of the Father, however, which draws us out of ourselves to become more. Bataro points out that when we uh, receive this gaze from our own fathers, we naturally find it more easily in God the Father. So he says, fathers are supposed to be the link between heaven and earth. And when I read that, it really struck me hard, and I started asking, do I give a gaze of love to my spiritual children? Started examining my heart. How do I look at people? And I have to admit, sometimes I don't think I look at people with love. And it really started making me think. I thought about St. John Paul II. It's always said that whenever JP2 spent time with you, even 30 seconds, people said, just the way he looked at me, I felt so loved. I felt special. And there, God was working through him. 
So it's something I've really got to pray about more as a spiritual father. And I want to accept this challenge. I'm, I'm a man, I'm a spiritual father. And so my gift, my responsibility is to give what the father has given me. I have to give it to other people. And I pray all men will think about their own spiritual fatherhood. I, I pray all of you men can just reflect what kind of gaze you give to other people, particularly your children. God loves us perfectly with a mother's love. And a mother's love says that he will never abandon us. That's how, he, how much he loves us. But we call him father because he's transcendent and he calls us up to himself. It does matter that we call him father.